is a processor roundtable, and we'll structure this similarly to um, our producer roundtable. I will have our participants um, introduce themselves, and then we'll. Um, I'll ask a series of questions and we'll hopefully have a few minutes at the end for questions for um, from um, our other participants. So just to get us started, started out um, briefly, we have um, Kevin Buckland, who's the COO of Cuga Milk Ingredients here in New York State. We have um, Jean Butzer from Upstate Niagara Cooperative. And we have Emily Aldrich from Rogue Creamery. So um, I'll just ask each of you to uh, briefly introduce yourselves, your backgrounds, um, what uh, your role in the organic dairy industry is, specifically which products you're making, um, and sort of how long your um, organization has been um, in, in the organic dairy industry. And we'll start with um, Kevin. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, apologize, my camera's not working today, but um, just a quick overview, uh, COO of Cuba Milk Ingredients. Uh, we are a plant located in, in Auburn, New York. Uh, we opened up in 2014 and we've been producing uh, dairy products uh, for obviously since 2014, but specifically organic uh, for about the last four years. Uh, we produce a wide variety of uh, liquid and powder ingredients uh, for organic processors, organic uh, companies, I should say, and uh, looking forward to the, to the discussions today. Thanks, Kevin. Gene, can you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Gene Butzer, Director of Quality here at Upstate Niagara. Um, we've been doing organic products, I believe, at least 10 years, potentially longer than that. We started out purchasing organic milk from, uh, from the outside. And when we realized the market was, was taking off, we actually converted a lot of our, our current membership to organic farms. So we offered a premium to do that uh, transition and that went very well. Um, sometimes we struggle to get a balance of uh, how much milk is needed and how much organic cream is needed and, and things like that. But uh, overall, it's been very positive. Uh, we've got three facilities that are, I'm sorry, four facilities that are organic approved. Um, two of the facilities, three of the facilities are, are, are currently manufacturing organic products. It's anywhere from fluid milks and creams to uh, uh, yogurts. Uh, we haven't evolved into any other products at this time, but there is, there is some interest there to do that. We also have a sister plant, OAGA, that uh, puts up some organic butter and things like that as well. Thanks, That's it. Jean. Sure. Emily, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily. Um, I work at Rogue Creamery. I'm the quality manager there. We manufacture organic blue cheese and organic cheddar cheese. We also um, do non-organic products as well. We've been doing that since about 2014. And um, we also have our own dairy and we, I manage the livestock and crop aspects of that as well. Emily is truly a, a jack of all trades here. She's <laughs> touching everything. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all for being with us. And I'm gonna start out with a similar question that I asked the producer group and that is, um, what barriers do you see? What challenges do you see um, to expanding your organic dairy um, business and, and in general, the organic dairy sector um, from the processing uh, perspective? So this could be anything from, um, you know, the quality of the, the incoming milk, the um, regulatory environment, where do you see the biggest challenges and barriers? And I'll, um, sorry about that, I'll, I'll start with Kevin. Yeah, so I think from, from our perspective, it's both good and bad. Um, you know, the good news is we've seen a, a lot of SKU growth. A lot of different products have uh, been initiated over the last probably two years or so. Uh, you know, we're producing a lot more protein-based, uh, high-protein drink type products. Uh, we're doing a lot more with uh, fortification and blending of, of different uh formulations for specialty items that were not here three years ago. 
So it's for us as a processor, it becomes a challenge because for every different type of product, obviously we need different silos, segregation opportunities. So that alone, it's a, so in a, in a perfect world for, for organic processing, then we would prefer probably smaller processing tanks and more of them versus large processing capacity tanks and silos, equipment, et cetera. So it becomes a challenge for us each week now to, to get all of the various components and products ran through our manufacturing facility. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Gene, what's your perspective? Uh, similar, you know, the organic obviously has to be run first. So you might run that four or five days a week. Um, and then you've got, you go on to your conventional products and it, it, it can be difficult sometimes to schedule, uh, you know, the, the organic runs and things like that as well as uh, some of your uh, smaller farms, uh, trying to get a full load of milk and scheduling those into some plants. It, it, it's a balancing act. Um, it's a good thing we have a couple different plants that can receive organic milk. We've got three that are currently receiving organic milk so we can balance it that way. And we do partner with, uh, with other uh, companies if we have extra organic cream or we're short. Um, but again, it's, you know, you, you can't always balance it out perfectly. So we try not to convert organic milk into conventional because obviously we pay a premium for that. But uh, we do have a market for it. If we have too much, uh, if we don't have enough, then that's another situation altogether. And have you run into that at all, Gene, over the, the several years that you guys have been processing organic? Yeah, month to month, it's, it's like I said, it's a balancing act. It's, it's difficult. Uh, um, sometimes you get new customers coming in and you don't know how much milk to contract for if you need to get some milk from the outside. Obviously, the, we, we utilize all our own organic milk from our members because you have a better handle on the quality and, and the consistency of that milk. Whenever you're buying on the spot, spot market, you can have some additional quality concerns and, and problems. Yeah, that makes sense. Emily, what's your perspective on um, barriers and challenges? Um, I definitely echo everybody else's um, sentiment of the kind of challenges in the scheduling aspect of, of processing organic and conventional milk side by side um, and the milk storage, as well as the quality variations that we see in our organic milk sources. Um, which definitely ties into the mastitis conversation we were having earlier. Uh, also being an artisan blue cheese manufacturer and, you know, we're kind of growing into a new phase of our business and really looking to be competitive in the blue cheese market at the retail level um, is definitely a challenge for us with the higher milk prices and trying to get into different markets on the retail level. So sort of a, as a follow-up to the conversation we were having this morning um, about innovation and um, opportunities even for like the export market, I'd love to hear each of your thoughts on sort of the approach that you take to innovation um, in your organic products and um, you know how you are pushing that effort in order to reach new consumers or new markets. Um, and for those of you who may have um, the opportunity to export out of the the country, what are the um, what are the factors there that you're considering as far as increasing that the export opportunities? Again, Kevin, if you could um, start. Sure. Us. Sure. Yep. So from a processor perspective here, um, the people, the companies that we currently co-pack for, fortunately for us have a, a great R&D branch uh, within their organization. So we work hand in hand with them on any new products that they're developing. Uh, as mentioned earlier, you know, the good news is that we, we can produce powdered dairy products. So the export opportunity is, is very large. Um, obviously like anything else overseas, uh, infant formula based product and anything that's protein uh, fortified is continuing to grow in today's market. So anything we can do to help them formulate and uh, manufacture those types of products 
uh, they're very much value added and, uh, and growing at a very rapid rate. So uh, with the extended shelf life, uh, typically our powders are anywhere from one to two years and uh, anything domestically that we can do on a liquid perspective, obviously we're, we're doing that as well. Uh, we offer tanker load quantities, which are anywhere from, you know, 45,000 pounds up to 70,000 pounds, depending on where it's going. And then we also offer 300 gallon totes if, uh, if a uh, organic processor wants to take our product, our ingredient and turn it into a, a different finished product at another manufacturing plant, we can also offer it in totes. So, so we're trying to diversify our, our product offering and our package size, if you will, that comes out of Kiuga. Great, thanks, Kevin. Gene. So uh, exporting organic, we haven't done much of that really. Um, most of the, our markets are here in the US and uh, uh, just filling those needs are, are sufficient for what we need. If there is an opportunity that comes along, we're obviously we're, we're open to it, but uh, um, the organic business that we have, we're trying to maintain and trying to uh, uh, keep a steady supply of, of obviously the, the milk from our member farms as well as supplying our, our current customers. So, but if something opens up, if there's an opportunity with other, other companies, obviously to help balance the organic supply, we're more than willing to do that, so. And Emily. Um, yeah, we're definitely working on innovations in our in our formats um, that we sell and looking at new opportunities by changing those a little bit. And that's really exciting for us. Uh, and working with other, um, you know, organic dairy brands and trying to get some uh, projects going with them to kind of diversify our um, our kind of, which is kind of what we're doing at the plant level. Um, and then in terms of exporting dairy products, we've been working over the last few years on exporting some of our raw milk blue cheese to the EU. And um, that's been a successful and growing program for us, though it's probably very small compared to what some other exporters are doing. Um, but it has been challenging in terms of finding organic importers and organic importers that, um, you know, can deal with refrigerated product. That was probably the biggest hurdle for us in, in starting the program. And now that we've got that, we're kind of uh, good to go for the EU, which is really exciting. Yeah, that's, that is fantastic. Um, so one thing that was brought up this morning was sort of this um, that that Sarah brought up, I think, was the the way that organic the organic um, producers were sort of insulated from some of the effects of um, COVID um, uh, distribution chain um, supply issues, where producers had to dump milk. And I'm curious um, to hear what our our panel. Um, has to say about how uh, these supply issues might have affected their organic um, products as well. Kevin, is that something you could um, speak to from the CMI? Yeah. Perspective? Yes. Um, so fortunately for us, obviously, we've, we've been considered essential really from day one uh, since COVID started. So, um, and we didn't really see, we saw the big uh, whipsaw changes that you uh, probably remember back in March and April when, when COVID first really took off. Uh, we saw that for maybe a six, eight week period, but then after that, it, it pretty well stabilized and uh, we have been able to continue to manufacture the organic portion of our portfolio for our, our uh, suppliers. Um, so for the most part, because uh, I think just because once the, the supply chain stabled out, you know, from April, May forward, uh, we've been pretty steady. We've been running at about 90% of capacity in the plant and the portfolio of organic products has pretty much stayed consistent where it was uh, this spring, so. No, that's great. Gene, how was um, that period for you? Very similar to what Kevin had described. Um, it, it did level out uh, in the summer. Um, it wasn't until uh, the recent holiday here's uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas 
Um, and it's not just organic milk. It's, it's just every, all kinds of milk, conventional milk. It seems like there's a, there's quite a glut and it's difficult to put it into things like powder, condensed milk, things that have a longer shelf life. We just don't have enough capacity. So it's, and, and talking with other uh, processors as well, they're, they're having the same struggles. And Emily, how's your experience been? Um, I'd say it's been pretty similar. You know, in in April and May, we saw a pretty big decrease in in um, wholesale sales or or food service sales. Um, but you know, we've actually been pretty lucky to see a huge growth in our retail formats. Um, so it's been a challenge for us from a production standpoint because we're really geared to produce um, for food service. That's what that's our most efficient kind of manner of pr processing. But we've been able to kind of uh, switch gears and meet those new demands and um, really work on making those formats uh, efficient for us. So there's been opportunity, um, but we definitely were impacted. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a few um, a few questions coming into the chat that I want to touch on. Um, Carrie asks for each of you, what are the types of indicators that you're using to monitor or measure the quality of the organic raw milk coming into your your facility? So Kevin, we'll start with you. Yeah, so, so we use pretty much the same that we would use on conventional milk, um, you know, uh, standard plate count, uh, direct mic count, uh, pH, flavor, uh, titratable acidity, um, you know, then obviously on finished product, uh, we're doing the, the full gamut. Uh, we're looking for thermophilic spores, mesophilic spores, uh, again, standard plate count, yeast and mold. So really nothing different um, that we're doing organically versus uh, conventional. Okay, great. And Gene? Yeah, something we've added recently is uh, doing some flavoring on the incoming raw milk supplies, whether it's organic or conventional. Um, just uh, the spore levels too, we're doing some, uh, um, some, over, some uh, general uh, testing on it just to make sure the, the spore loads are not too high coming in. Um, but that's other than the normal testing, as, as Kevin mentioned. Great. And Emily? Yeah, we um, are looking at those standard components, SEC, all of those good, good indicators. But ones that have been particularly useful for us are, are the PI, pre-incubation, pre um, as well as coliforms, SPC. Carrie, did that answer answer your question? Did you have any um, follow up on that? Well, we'll move on. And if you do have a follow up, um, go ahead and just put it in the the chat. Um, Martin asks, are there innovation and product development challenges that are that are unique to your to organic dairy as opposed to a conventional dairy? Um, so this is Kevin. Uh, not really. I think it's it becomes a, a batch size thing more than anything. Uh, obviously, you know what we've seen is organic customers are just as interested as innovation and in products as as you know non organic customers. Um, I think it comes down to if the batch size is too small for these larger manufacturing plants. Sometimes then it becomes a challenge to to process it without significant losses. So, but outside of that, no. I mean. Uh, Again, a dairy product, I think, as long as the volume is there and uh, uh, the customer base is there, you know, our R&D our center is, is more than willing to work on it and develop products, so. Great, and Gene? Yeah, same thing that Kevin had said. Um, another thing that uh, we've seen is uh, when organics really came out strong, we were getting quite a bit of uh, additional uh, uh, value on the on the products, and we've seen that difference between conventional and, and uh, organic. It uh, that that difference has shrunk over the years. So, and it's not just the dairy portion of it. Uh, also, the fruit or any inclusions that you might put in uh, yogurts and things like that. 
it's difficult to uh, to get that back out of the marketplace. It's it's getting more difficult, I should say. Go ahead, Emily. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity in the organic market, and I don't personally come across a ton of hurdles. Um, I think it's mostly just focusing on improving, continuous improvement. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, similar to what I asked the, the producers, um, what do you see as the, the key needs for organic processors moving forward in terms of, um, you know, sort of education, research, training needs, those types of things? Kevin, you can start. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you always, always start with quality, you know, and, uh, um, you know, from a quality consistency perspective, I think that's the biggest biggest challenge that we see is uh, we, we do see very small farms sometimes coming in with higher DMC counts and higher standard plate counts, sometimes even affecting our separators um, on how often they have to desludge on, on uh, run times, et cetera. But I think uh, product consistency, quality consistency, and, you know, other than that, I, I you know, I, I see it really as an, uh, you know, many, many opportunities for organic advancement, uh, other, nothing really holding it back. Okay, thank you. Jean. I apologize. I, I missed the first part of the question, Nicole. Yeah, no problem. Um, where do you see the, the um, needs of organic processing um, moving forward as far as, you know, research or education or, um, or, you know, training, those types of things? What, what are, what can we um, do as a community to uh, make organic processing more successful? I think, uh, you know, if, like marketing and things like that, as I, and as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the, uh, the value of organic seems like it has been, uh, uh, it's getting closer to conventional. So that, that is a struggle. You know, how do we, how do we educate our customers? How do we motivate them? You know, especially during this pandemic, um, some people are, are a little bit re more reluctant to pay additional costs for that, where your real loyal customers, they'll pay it, you know. Um, I guess uh, opportunities, at least from our end, we haven't seen a lot of uh, abundance of, of new opportunities. You know, we, we continue with uh, our relationships with our current vendors, our current uh, uh, farmers, our current uh, uh, so, uh, customers as well. And, that, and that's a good thing. So we're, we're maintaining what we have. But I think the newer opportunities, the growth, I, it, it appears to have slowed. Okay, thanks. Emily. Um, I am having a little brain moment where my brain is blank. <laughs> No worries. No worries. If you think of, of something that needs to be um, thrown out there, just let us know. So, I I think we, um, so, so we have a couple of um, comments in the, in the chat box that we'll, we'll jump to. Um, first of all, a specific question for Kevin um, in regards to the export market opportunities. Do you see that as a growing um, opportunity or there, you know, um, is that a market where new processors could get into organic and and um, and have a market for their organic powder? Yes, I, I believe so. You know, mostly focused on the the low spore powders now. You know, that's one thing that we really initiated back in 2014. We wanted to be one of the major players in, in not only North America but in uh, but in the world as far as competing with uh, the Fonterras and the whatnots of the world that have. Uh, product portfolios with very low uh, thermophilic spores and knock on wood to date uh, we've been able to do that and uh, you know it does start at the farm as you can imagine uh, so as long as the spore counts are low coming off the farms the you know we've proven over the years here that we can from a processing perspective we can maintain those low spore counts so I think anytime uh, you know an organic producer can 
uh, look for that market. And again, whether it's infant formula based products or protein fortified uh, initiatives, uh, which are endless, really, it seems like the other thing that we're starting to see is more blending of, uh, of a dairy based product with a non dairy based plant based product. So I think any and all of those are opportunities, but uh, low spore uh, powder, obviously consumers get more intelligent all the time on uh, quality based initiatives. And uh, that's only going to continue, I think, as time goes on. So, so yes, significant opportunities. That's great. I think Kathy mentioned um, also the whey powder for nutritional drinks, organic whey powders could be um, yes. an opportunity there. Yep. Um, uh, and Robert bringing up the, the point of organic um, a2 milk. So I would love to hear any of your thoughts on um, the market for uh, A2 milk, if any of you are doing an um, organic A2 product or have any, any thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I guess it's always the challenge of, uh, you know, the marketers, it's always a big debate, right, whether it's real or not, but obviously A2 milk company is making it uh, very profitable. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, we are, we are working with them on, on some other products as far as product development and some other things that uh, uh, we're working with. But I think it's, I think it's always um, interesting to see how a, a new market can be opened up like that and, uh, and proven. You know, obviously, they've been around now, gosh, I don't know, 10 plus years, I think. But it's, it's just always intriguing and interesting how you just kind of think research is, is uh, maybe coming to a, you know, an envelope where you, you, you don't have as many opportunities and these new markets open. And uh, it, it's always intriguing and challenging for us as processors to see that uh, uh, endless opportunities, I think. So uh, I, I think we're just beginning to see uh, what we call micronutrients. Uh, some of the micronutrient questions that we're getting from customers now are, you know, some of them we don't even know or understand yet because they're relatively new. Uh, chlorates and perchlorates and some of these different uh, uh, initiatives on the, on the micronutrients or, you know, even some are considered contaminants. Uh, so I, I think that piece of the industry is just beginning. Yeah. And that really goes back to, you know, sort of our first discussion today with Steve and, um, you know, sort of, I, I don't remember who, who brought up nutrient profile of organic milk, but that's something that um, maybe, you know, needs some additional research. Um, Jean, did you have any um, comment on the A2 milk, organic A2 milk? Yeah, so uh, A2, a lot of our members have looked at it, even the conventional uh, members, you know, a lot of times if they can uh, use a sire that has the, uh, those genetics, they'll use those over, you know, just a normal sire so that their herd is, you know, if, if they wanted to convert to A2, they're going to have a lot a lot better opportunity to do that. Um, as far as capitalizing on it, um, we're not there yet. You know, it's it's a it's a trend that we're looking at, and the the board is looking at. You know, is is that something we want to go down down that road? Obviously, it's another segregation of milk. You know, just like organic, um, we currently have uh, you know uh, uh, supervised kosher as well. So the more <laughs> The more different uh, types of uh, unique milk that we have, the more we have to segregate. So it's there's it's 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 kind of complicated, but it's an opportunity that's out there, and if it presents itself. Um, one thing that Kevin mentioned was the uh, the whey and the the byproducts, and that, that's one thing. It's an opportunity that I'd like to uh, explore more here at, at our company. So the more and more yogurt that we do, the Greek yogurt, and the, now that we have the cheese plant out in Campbell. Um, there's a lot of byproducts that uh, could be used for uh, more profitable means or more, you know, there's, there's a market out there that, uh, that's still in its infancy, I should say, that, that uh, has a lot of value. Yeah, and I think that perspective on um, the logistics of processing these various um, products is, is really important to consider. Emily, did you have any thoughts to add to the A2 yeah. conversation? Um, not specifically the A2 conversation, but the um, way and kind of byproduct conversation. I think that there's a ton of opportunity there. Uh, we produce a lot of way and um, 
you know, we're working on solutions to make it a value added um, opportunity. Uh, also, I think just opportunities for the organic dairy industry is really um, supporting more efforts to help small to medium-sized manufacturers maintain organic certification. Um, that cost can be a lot and, and require quite a bit of time and, and documentation and such. And I think that the expansion of or the organic name into kind of those smaller businesses would be a huge opportunity. Great, that's, yeah, very good, very good feedback. Okay, so um, I think we're we're right at the end of our time for our um, processor roundtable. So I want to thank um, Kevin and Jean and Emily for your time and for your your great thoughts and and feedback. Certainly, a lot of good things for us to to consider um, for organic dairy stakeholders. Mm -hmm.